In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've titled this message, Love. Love because you are loved. And we begin with the Genesis story from Genesis 45. This chapter is the heart of the story of Joseph, narrated for us in Genesis 37 to 50. We know the story. Being his father's favorite son, Joseph was hated by his own brothers, hated enough to be sold as a slave to total strangers, Egyptian traders, in the hope that he would disappear from their lives. But things did not turn out as the brothers anticipated. Instead, Joseph was recognized in Egypt as a capable, godly person and was elevated to a very high level in that country. Besides, there was a famine that stretched all the way from Northern Africa up to Israel. Joseph as the person in charge did such a good job that in time, Egypt alone among the surrounding nations had food that had been stored up for any emergency. And in due course, Joseph's brothers came down from Israel to Egypt looking for food not having the slightest notion of whom they were going to have to deal with. Now just for a moment, put yourself in Joseph's place. You've been badly treated by your own brothers, literally pushed out of their lives. And now here they are looking for help and looking to you for that help. We would all agree that no one would be surprised if Joseph had retaliated and treated them as badly as they had treated him, or worse. The surprise is that Joseph did precisely the opposite. He was delighted to see them and to receive them. How is that possible? His perspective was different. Look at the passage. If you have your Bibles, just look at Genesis 45 and look at verses 5, 7, and 8. Three times over, Joseph tells his brothers, God sent me here. Although Joseph's brothers wanted to get rid of him, God used even their evil actions to fulfill his ultimate plan. He had sent Joseph ahead to preserve their lives, to save Egypt and prepare the way for the beginning of the nation of Israel. The underlying point is that God is sovereign. His plans are not dictated by human actions. When others intend evil towards us, Remember that they are only God's tools. As Joseph said to his brothers in chapter 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We can't help but notice various details in the narrative. He wept so much with joy at his seeing his brothers that they began to feel guilty for the way they had treated him. In verse 3, we read that. He wanted to catch up with family news, particularly interested in how his father was doing and his youngest brother, Benjamin. He saw God's hand in all that had happened and began to plan how they could come to Egypt during the famine and so on. Is there a single hint of a desire to make them pay 
for their jealousy and unfair treatment of him? None whatsoever. Why? Because he sees a backstory. God was using them to fulfill his own plans. The remarkable thing is that this is an Old Testament story. But if we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, a section of the letter in which the Apostle Paul refers to his suffering and difficulty as a minister of the gospel, he says this, so we do not lose heart. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Interesting, isn't it, that both Joseph and Paul are on the same page. They refuse to be disheartened by their circumstances, for they concentrated on the backstory, the hand of God fulfilling his purpose in their own lives, and in the lives of others. Do we want to be able to rise above mere tit for tat behavior? Mere eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, thinking that society around us here in India subscribes to? Look at Joseph, look at Paul, two examples of those who did precisely the opposite. Instead of retaliation, they put things in fuller perspective and loved those who showed no love to them. The example par excellence of this loving response to those who mistreat us, however, is the Lord Jesus himself. And we turn to our gospel reading where he talked about loving our enemies. Luke chapter six, was 27 to 38. This passage could be titled, There is blessing in the kingdom of God if its members are people of love. In verse 27, we have the words, love your enemies. The Jews despised the Romans because they oppressed God's people. But Jesus told the people to love these enemies. Such words turned away many from Christ. Jesus wasn't talking about having affection for enemies. He was talking about an act of will. You can't fall into this kind of love. It takes conscious effort. Loving our enemies means acting in their best interests. We can pray for them. We can think of ways to help them. God loves the whole world, even though the world is in rebellion against him. Jesus asks us to follow his example by loving our enemies. Grant our enemies the same respect and rights as we desire for ourselves. This whole section of imperatives deals with an attitude of sacrificial, self-giving love. How do believers do this? In verse 27, it says, do good to those who hate you. Verse 28, pray for those who mistreat you. Verse 29, turn the other cheek. 29, give away your clothes. And 30, give to all who ask. These are to be done even in the face of abuse by others. We act in such a way because of who we are in Christ, not how we are treated. Our witness of sacrificial self-giving love is even more powerful in the face of abuse. In verse 28, we read, pray for those who mistreat you. If believers take offense or try to avenge themselves, they lose the blessing 
the joy and the contentment. Anger, hatred, and other emotions of the flesh can rob even believers of peace and contentment. They can also open the spiritual door for Satan to attack. We must give the pain to God. Often our love breaks down the barriers and provides an opportunity for witnessing. Our forgiveness releases a joy in us and guilt in the abusers, as happened in the case of Joseph's brothers. In verse 35, Jesus promises, you will be sons of the Most High. What an, we should exemplify the loving, giving family characteristics of God, not the self-centered, the me first characteristics of fallen humanity or of those who oppose God's purposes. Jesus also says, for God himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Thank God that there's no tit for tat in him. The only hope for sinners is the unchanging, gracious, merciful, loving character of God. In verses 37 and 38, a forgiving spirit demonstrates Jesus said that a person has received God's forgiveness. Jesus used the picture of measuring grain in a basket to ensure the full amount. If we are critical rather than compassionate, we will also receive criticism. But if we treat others generously, graciously, and compassionately, we, these qualities will come back to us in full measure. We are to love others, not judge them. We love because God loves us. We forgive because God forgives us. And that brings us to our reading from the epistle, where the discussion widens not to just to forgiveness, but to loving others. Everyone believes that love is important. But love is usually thought of as a feeling. In reality, love is a choice and an action. God is the source of our love. He loved us enough to sacrifice his son for us. Jesus is our example of what it means to love. Everything he did in life and death was supremely loving. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to love. He lives in our hearts and makes us more and more like Christ. God's love always involves a choice and an action. And our love should be like his. We need to ask ourselves, how well do we display our love for God in the choices that we make and the actions that we take. Now in, chapter, in verse eight of chapter four, first John chapter four, John says, God is love. Note, God is love, not love is God. Our world with its shallow and selfish view of love has turned these words around and contaminated our understanding of God. The world thinks that love is what makes a person feel good and that it is all right to sacrifice moral principles and others' rights in order to obtain such love. But that isn't real love. It's the exact opposite. It is selfishness. And God is not that kind of love. Real love is like God, who is holy, just, and perfect. If we truly love God, we will love as he does. If you look carefully at verses 9 to 11, 9, 9 to 12, actually, we have a firm focus on the cross. The cross of the Lord Jesus is the greatest demonstration of love that there is. Think who Jesus was. Recognize that God took the initiative, 
and think what Christ endured. In verse 9, we are reminded that Jesus is God's only son. While all believers are sons and daughters of God, only Jesus lives in this special, unique relationship. And in verse 10, love explains. One, why God creates. Because he loves, he creates people to love. Why does God care? Because he loves them. He cares for sinful people. Why are we free to choose? Because God wants a loving response from us. And why did Christ die? His love for us caused him to offer a solution to the promise of sin. And why do we receive eternal life? Because God's love expresses to itself to us forever. Nothing sinful or evil can exist in God's presence. He is absolute goodness. He cannot overlook, condone, or excuse sin as though it never happened. He loves us, but his love does not make him morally lax. If we trust in Christ, however, we will not have to bear the penalty for our sins. We will be acquitted by Jesus' work on the cross. In verse 12, we read about not no one ever seeing God. And if, if no one has ever seen God, how can we ever know him? We are reminded of that verse from John's gospel. John chapter 1, verse 18 says, the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father, he has made God known. Jesus is the complete expression of God in human form. And he's revealed God to us. When we love one another, the invisible God reveals himself to others through us. And his love is made complete. Some people enjoy being with others. They make friends with strangers easily and are always surrounded by friends. Other people are shy or reserved. They have a few friends but are frequently uncomfortable talking with people that they don't know or mixing in crowds. Shy people don't need to become extroverts in order to love others. John isn't telling us how many people to love, but how much to love the people that we already know. Our joy is to love faithfully the people of, that God has given us to love, whether there are two or 200 of them. If God sees that we are ready to love others, he will bring them to us. No matter how shy we are, we don't need to be afraid of the love commandment. God provides us strength to do what he asks. And that brings us to the thought of the Holy Spirit that John deals with in verses 13 to 16. When we become Christians, we receive the Holy Spirit. God's presence in our life is proof that we really belong to him. He also gives us the power to love. Rely on that power as we reach out to others. As we do so, we will gain confidence. So in our reflections on the biblical text today, we begin with the outstanding example of forgiveness, Joseph. Then we recognize the parallel in the way of thinking of the apostle Paul. And from our gospel reading, we learned that the source of such thinking is the Lord Jesus himself. And in our reading of, from the epistle, we were reminded that forgiveness is just one way of expressing basic love. We love because we know that we are loved. This is quite a challenge. Let us seek God's grace and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to meet that challenge. Amen.